<laughs> All right, everybody, thanks for coming to Grand Rounds today. We're going to go get started. Uh, today, we have our speaker, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Kristen Matthews, with our Division of Public Health Care and also our ICCM. Uh, she's one of our group of care doctors and also um, in our ICU. You uh, guys have probably worked with her before in the past. Um, she's going to talk to us about ICU care, and we thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much. All right, so I appreciate the invitation. Um, I know that it uh, seems a little odd to be talking about like ED to ICU transitions of care, but as uh, I think uh, Trini knows that coming from Yale, where all critically ill patients ended up in the ICU pretty fast, it was a really eye-opening experience to come to Sinai, where uh, all of a sudden I have vented patients on the floor. I was like, this is a totally different world. Um, and a lot of these patients are folks that the hospice service are caring for. So hopefully with that, I will be able to talk about um, improving care delivery at the EDICU interface. So first, my disclosures. Um, I'm funded by a K23 currently. I'm also one of the pedal co-investigators. And I'm a scientific advisor for the Mount Sinai Data Warehouse and Department of Scientific Computing. I'm also going to refer to some research um, uh, results that were funded by previous grants. Yes, yeah, yeah. Now I see the look. And I'm totally <laughs> willing. I'm very excited. Um, so first, I want to start with a case. Um, this is actually all the cases I'm going to talk about today are all Sinai cases. Change a couple things for you know purposes of so it's not so identifiable. But they're all things that happened since I've been here. So it's a 32-year-old woman who is four days postpartum who presents to the ED uh, with fever and fatigue. She's febrile, tacky, blood pressure's all right. Um, respiratory rate 24, satting okay in room air, but she's got a white count. pH is terrible, but she's got a severe lactic acidosis. And in EED, they recognize her as critically ill. They give her, they resuscitate her. They give her antibiotics. They call an ICU consult. We come down, and we immediately know that she is critically ill, needs to come to the ICU. We accept her pretty fast, uh, very concerned that she has pretty severe sepsis. But, of course, there are no Mickey beds, so we contact the SICU. Um, and it's the weekend, so um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the processes of Sinai on the weekends. Everything sort of slows to a halt. Um, so with that, I want to say that not every hospital is has a gazillion beds. Sinai only has 14 NICU beds. Yale has 40. Cleveland Clinic has 300. So why is it that? <laughs> yeah, I know it's pretty amazing. Their ratios are amazing. No, not just NICU, but all ICU. But so having no beds here at Sinai is a very common occurrence, and it's a pain that's felt by every service in this hospital. Now, despite the clinical ramifications of crowding and high workload being commonplace, I expect the operations itself is not something that you guys talk about every day. Um, so the outline for my talk today is to give you some background on boarding as it relates to critically ill patients at the EDICU interface, give you some a quick overview, some building blocks about operations research and operations management. And then uh, hopefully, like, we'll talk about some case studies and how this applies to the process of healthcare delivery uh, and talk about some best practices and next steps. So we all know that there is a high demand for critical care services in the U.S. More than around 6 million patients uh, are admitted to the ICU every year. And this burden is felt significantly by the ED. 13% of ED admissions go to an ICU. And looking at the National Hospital of ambulatory medical care survey data show that um, over the last decade, we've seen a 50% increase in the number of admissions, especially in the elderly patient population. We also know that about 20% of all hospitalizations involve an ICU stay, but this is variable depending on your diagnosis and the service line. I'm looking at a multi-hospital, multi-year data set, and when I limit it to just respiratory-related DRGs, I find that the actual the rate of ICU utilization is actually 40%. Now, for our discussion today, I'm actually going to focus primarily on the medical ICU patient because this is a cohort of patients that has a significant variability in the diagnosis, severity of illness, but also the demand, the volume, their length of stay once they show up in my ICU and so on. And there is a minimal number of elective or scheduled admissions, which in the SICU world or in the, the you know, when you're admitting patients for a post op you've got to make sure that the flow from the OR to the PACU to the SICU is fine. So it's a very different beast. So let's talk about ICU boarding in the ED. How often is this happening? So in a survey we conducted a few years ago, 72% of practicing EM physicians in the U.S. reported regularly caring for boarding ICU patients. Now, many institutions, including our own, 
state that they prioritize critically ill patient admissions to upstairs as quickly as possible. And it's the general medicine population that actually spends their time waiting in the ED. But again, using the NHAMSI's data, they actually, Pitts and colleagues found that in 2010, 30% of the ICU admissions bordered longer than two hours. Now, two hours, seriously, sign IED, two hours is great. I actually have a handful of patients that usually wait longer than 24 hours to come into my unit. But the metric for EDs to evaluate themselves to say that this is too much is often used as its two hour or four hour mark. But there's no official cutoff for what's deemed excessive boarding. Like I said, there's some general recommendations. But in general, boarding high acuity patients in the ED has been associated with poor patient outcomes. I'm going to say this caveat before I discuss the literature that's here. It really depends on the ED and what kind of resources are available. How equipped is the ED to deal with ongoing critical care management of these patients? And that's, that's something that we'll talk about later on as we go through the different cases. But in the literature, Chalfin and colleagues found, this is a ret retrospective cohort study of 50,000 ICU patients, this is using the project impact data, found that delays of greater than six hours to get into the ICU were associated with higher ICU mortality, higher in-hospital mortality, and longer hospital like this day. Now, Cardozo and colleagues designed a prospective cohort study with 400 adult patients admitted to an ICU to evaluate the correlation between mortality and delay in ICU admission from the ED specifically. And every each hour of delayed transfer to the ICU was independently associated with a 1.5 increased odds of mortality. This is controlling for the diagnosis, the patient characteristics, including severity of illness. So like how fast we're supposed to get antibiotics into a patient, every hour is associated with X percent increased risk of dying. Well, we find that there's a tributal risk of these delays to this patient's mortality. But both of these studies focused on cohorts of patients that ended up in the ICU. And from doing the consult service, I know that not every patient that I see down in the ED, or on the wards for that matter, actually is admitted to the ICU. So in my research, we actually look at operations data to investigate the effect of crowding on patient outcomes. And we found similar findings to Cardozo and Chalfin, but in, the, in our case, we actually adjusted for the selection bias associated with the admission decision, because we're only selecting certain patients to be admitted to the ICU. We used uh, bed, we looked at any patient who, for whom a console for ICU admission was requested, and we used bed management data to pull in the ED census and clinical demand, ward and ICU crowding, as well as granular EHR data for the individual patient's diagnosis, severity of illness, and the like. And then using propensity score analysis to account for the ICU admission decision for the, for the selection bias, we found that waiting in the ED was associated with a higher odds of morbidity and mortality regardless if you showed up in the ICU or not. And this is a, a composite score, a POD plus D, that we use in critical care, which is persistent organ dysfunction and death, which is basically by hospital day 28, have you died, are you still on vasopressors, mechanical ventilation, or new HD? So again, it's a composite score of both morbidity and mortality. Now, when we think about the, this crucial period of when we're deciding who to admit, these transitions of care, in what order, and acknowledging that there is going to be this likelihood of delays, this is what I'm going to call the EDICU interface. Patients remain critically ill and very vulnerable to any lapses in the attention if, they, if, pay, if your, your provider is actually taking care of somebody else who's coming in. And with, there's often more than one handoff in care, depending on how long they're waiting downstairs in the EED. So with that, I want to talk about operations research and operations management, talk about how we can actually apply it to look at the ED ICU interface. So how we get patients to where they need to go as quickly as possible. This is managing throughput and actually lessons learned from the manufacturing world. Um, and we want to conduct something called value stream mapping, which is where we visually describe every step in the process to produce or reach a specific outcome, like getting our patient into the ICU. And now every process has steps that have actually no value to the patient. These are our waste steps. And you're going to, and Processes are more are often more improved by limiting these valueless steps, this waste, than by actually focusing on the, the processes that add value to the patient, like the active patient care. So many of you will recognize this as the Lean system or Six Sigma, um, which both of which provide a framework for improving the process efficiencies as well as addressing the inefficiencies in the system. 
Now, operations research versus operations management. So operations research is the discipline that deals with the application of these advanced analytics the, uh, to make these better decisions. It involves, it's often called management science or analytics. It involves uh, employing techniques from the mathematical sciences like modeling, statistical analysis, mathematical optimization, a lot of big words, but basically we're applying these techniques to actually develop optimal or near optimal solutions to complex decision making pro uh, problems. You often hear people talking about simulations and we're simulating a, uh, like a, the flow of a patient through an ICU. This is an example of operations research. Now operations management it deals with the design and management of structure, products, processes, services, and supply chains. Deals with acquisition, development, and the infrastructure of the resources and the staffing in each hospital. In order, whatever it takes in order to, what we need to build in order to provide better care. So think of it that our OR, Operations Research, is the applied map, and then you use OR tools and techniques to do operations management research. And I will say the operations management, just because of the nature of the game, it's not just limited to sort of what you can sort of quantitatively address, but also involves things like organizational behavior, institutional culture, the attitudes toward like who we should prioritize to get upstairs or not. Now, these, this type of operations research can be quite complex if we just look at the process map of ICU flow. Now, to consider the variables affecting our patients through for expediting transfer into the ICU, we have to examine all the possible uh, locations for flow limitations, all the possible bottlenecks. How busy is the ED? How busy is the ICU? How many of my ICU patients are active patients, stable patients that I could potentially push out? Or they're just patients waiting for, your, for the ward bed to become available. Is there a step-down unit? How busy is the step-down unit? How busy are the wards? Are my ward beds being reserved for incoming ED patients? Are there pending discharges? Like, why is it taking so long for transport to be arranged? That kind of thing. And, and, and there are decisions at every single one of these transition points. So to look at this, you actually have to go a little bit more in depth. Remember, I was talking about simulation modeling. Well, that's something I've done. And actually, to build that model, we have to be very specific about the inputs and constraints. So the data that's used to build this model, to make sure it's most relevant to your institution, you'd be personalize it for your institution's data. So looking at Mount Sinai data, you know, in order to build a process of a patient flow, I got to look at timestamp data of all the arrivals, all the departures from the ICU, all the bed requests. I have to look at the decision constraints. What's a triage policy? How do we decide who comes first? How many beds do we have? What's the staffing ratios? And then we have to match to this historical data census counts. And the higher granularity is preferred, like every hour. Because again, it's not, daily census in the ICU really means nothing, because we're always at 14. But in, in, in an hourly basis, that number might change. And they're reflecting sort of the changes in bed availability. Now, this a lot of this data, all of this data actually, is all found in Epic or Cerner. And that's actually where I pull a lot of my information in order to make these decisions, in order to analyze what's happening to our patients. And it is being used by bed management to look at like how to get people through the system faster. But it's not used necessarily in a systematic way to improve process inefficiencies and develop things that will be sustainable interventions. I mean, I know we're doing huddles based on this data every day, but is there a way to automate it? Things like that. Or are there more structural changes that can really better accommodate the surge of patients that we're seeing every day? This is what simulation can help us do. So every hospital uh, actually encounters some kind of operational change, uh, challenges. Maybe it's not 100% of the time, although definitely at Sinai, it feels like it's 100% of the time that we're crowded. We have no beds. We're always in that red surge status, right? Um, but maybe it's that we focus on times of higher demand, like in flu season. And Sinai has had to ask itself the similar, like similar set of questions. What's important to them? Like, what are they prioritizing? What are the goals? What are we trying to optimize? Uh, what targets do we want to prioritize? Is it just patient outcomes? Is it that we want to improve throughput and reduce admission and transfer wait times from, in, uh, from the ED and to the ICU? Do we want to decrease the frequency of ambulance diversion? Do we want to increase bed turnover? 
optimize bed utilization, improve financial performance. We need to keep these beds filled so we can make some money. Or do we want to also think about avoiding burnout, staff, increasing staff reta retention? There's going to be always so many new emissions and more emissions. That's more burden workload for our frontline providers, for the hospitals who are taking care of these patients on the wards, holding on to them until an ICU bed becomes available. And of course, do we want to improve the quality of care that's delivered? So with that, I mean, it's from my perspective, it's actually pretty hard to think about operations research it's just in the abstract. So uh, what I want to do now uh, for the bulk of this talk is really to talk, take these basics of operations research in the context of real world situations. So these are all, again, cases from Sinai. Hopefully you guys don't recognize them, but I think they're pretty common, so we've probably all taken care of somebody like this. So for the first case, we have a 63-year-old woman with HCV cirrhosis, diabetes. She was recently here for osteomyelitis. She's now here with altered mental status, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. She's tacky, respiratory 26. Sats aren't awesome, but we gave her some oxygen. She's doing okay. White count is 18 with a lactate of 3. Uh, in the ED, you know, they're resuscitating her, sepsis alert goes off, they recognize that she's probably got a high risk for decompensation, so they call the ICU. Her lipase is actually through the roof, so we're concerned about pancreatitis, and, and so we evaluate her and accept her to the MICU, but there are no beds yet. Now, unfortunately, by 2 o'clock, we still don't have any beds. We do have one listed in the MICU, um, but... Uh, because the ED needs to decant, they actually admit her to the step-down unit. This is before we had the MPCU. Before we had the MPCU. Um, so, you guys, how many of you have been here long enough that you remember that four-bed medical step-down unit that was under your, your control? You know, the house staff, yeah. It's, it's been a while, because I think that the MPCU has been here now for at least two years. Um, but back when we had those four beds, we would put these ICU patients in there until we got them into the MICU. So these patients now go into the step-down unit, but unfortunately, by about 11 o'clock, there are still no MICU beds. The patient now has worsening um, mental status, and that patient who we have listed is actually listed against a patient on the wards who's pending discharge. I don't know where they're gonna go at 11 o'clock at night, but they're trying to get the patient out the door so they can empty it to turn this bed around. So not surprising, 4 o'clock this morning, I guess this patient magically leaves in the middle of the night, and at 4 o'clock, the ICU bed is now empty, but it's awaiting cleaning. The patient is now intubated. Lactate is now 7, getting more IV fluids, and the patient gets transferred to the MICU after change of shift. Now, the total wait time from acceptance to transfer here was over 21 hours. Now, some of you guys are smiling because we've all done, we've, not all, but like we see this, right? But what are the issues here? Why did this happen? This is, again, high MICU occupancy. We had ward-ready patients still in the MICU. We had to wait for the cleaning to take place. Of course, we also had to wait for change of shift, sign out, nurses, and stuff like that. And we can debate this all we want, but is the step-down unit uh, a, should, be appropriately use, should be used as a stopgap measure for ICU patients? I've got to see a couple of no's. I mean... It's being used that way. Should it be? Yeah. So, so for a patient, I see a patient coming into our hospital. In an ideal world, the process is pretty straightforward, common to many other hospitals. We start with triage in the ED. They get sta initially worked up, stabilized in the ED. They recognize the patient's critically ill. They call the consult. We come down and evaluate them. And assuming we accept them, there's this wait for the ICU bed. Right? This period is called the ED length of stay, both components. Once they're up in the ICU, assuming the bed is available, the ICU care takes place, we further stabilize them, we address their critical care needs, and then we make them ready for the wards, we request a ward bed. Now there's another period of waiting for that ward bed to become available. This is our total ICU length of stay. Now, and then they go out to the wards, they eventually get dispo, hopefully to home, or maybe to a SAR. But as we all know, there are bottlenecks that can happen at any point in this care, in the in the process care of going from triage to discharge, and maybe it's that they can't get that bed in the SAR, or there's a hot, they can't get transport arranged. So the patient stays in that ward bed longer. If they can't empty the ward bed. The patients in my ICU have to wait longer, and they basically crowd my ICU. 
If I can't empty an ICU bed, the patients wait in the ED longer. And then we go on diversion. So in this section here, I want to focus on the operational issue of that low MICU bed availability due to the high occupancy that we saw in this, this case, just to give you guys an example of how we can apply OR research, or like operations research. So again, the ICU length of stay is split between this period of active treatment until stabilization or service time and a period of waiting. This is the time after we've requested that ward bed for and this transfer. Now the service time, this active treatment, is really variable depending on how long they need me, like their diagnosis, how sick they are, how many interventions they need. But the time to transfer, this boarding to time in the ICU, is actually pretty dependent. It's independent of the patient itself, but really related to systems level issues. So we use system level, we use historical data to process, to model this process map and understand its implications for ICU bed availability. Here you see a plot based on the marginal effects from a model adjuster for patient characteristics, including diagnosis and severity of illness. They're also taking into consideration I see, I don't know if I should walk away from the but on the x-axis is increasing ICU census, so it's divided into quartiles, and each of the lines are increasing ward census. So when we examine the period of ICU, like to say, called service time, this is the period of active management, fortunately, there's not really a difference, significant difference. It's unaffected in times of high ICU or ward occupancy, meaning that we're not pushing patients out uh, before they are ready to go when we are busier. Good, this is fantastic. That's what we want to see. However, when we examine ICU boarding time or what the time that patients are waiting for that ward bed to become available, it's a different story. So when available ICU beds are scarce, when we're busier, patients actually experience minimal boarding. So a shorter ICU boarding time during periods of high ICU occupancy, we speed up the process, we become more efficient. So that's where you see all the curves as you move to the right are all dropping down. So all of the boarding time is decreasing as we get busier. Conversely, we actually observe, we observe that as the wards get busier, we see longer and longer ICU uh, boarding time. So this is a slowdown. So again, across, when you control for ICU occupancy, doesn't matter what quartile you're in, for every single one, as wards get busier, my ICU boarding time gets higher. There's actually also a very interesting thing that happens when the ICU is and the wards are both full. We actually, the, the curves aren't uniform. And actually, when the ICU is full and the wards are full, there's actually an increase of boarding time, an interaction. It's actually out of proportion to what you would normally expect if it was totally independent. And we actually see a 22% increase in boarding time when the ICUs are, are, are busy and the wards are busy, suggesting that the ward effects, the ward of bed availability has a stronger impact on ICU boarding time than ICU census. Suggest, you know, this is basically like, even if we're busy, it doesn't matter. You guys are the ones, your beds, if they're not free, we're just gonna hold them in the ICU longer, which uh, may not be the best use of an ICU bed, you know, if we're filling our ICUs with ward-ready patients. So what does this translate to in the real world? So going back to our schematic, the ICU boarding time or the time to transfer out of the ICU should be about an hour in an ideal world. This is what it was at Yale, actually. They really targeted trying to like get the patient moved with transport, getting the bed clean and ready for the next patient within one hour. That was the target. So looking at a data set of about 1,200 patients over nine months using this one hour metric. Again, this is a figment really here at Sinai, but one hour, that's what we want, right? We should see our boarding time goal should have been 48 bed days. But looking at the data, in reality, there was a total of 440 bed days that was just in this period of waste, this period of just waiting for the beds to become available. What does this translate to? Well, this is actually adjusting for the variability of the kinds of patients we were seeing in this data set. This is about 125 more patients that we could have admitted to the ICU, or 10% higher volume. So instead of, this is the equivalent, if we actually make our process more efficient, it's equivalent of actually building uh, and staffing three to four extra ICU beds. Now, let's do, move on to a second case. So we have a 54-year-old patient with a history of severe asthma 
multiple ED visits, hospitalizations, intubation last year, presents to the ED with shortness of breath and wheezing. They stabilize, start non-invasive, consult the ICU. We, we accept them, but there's going to be a four-hour delay. Well, unfortunately, recess gets busy, so the patient gets moved out to acute. And this is a picture I took of uh, a laminated sheet, very beautifully laminated sheet down in the ED of their overflow policy. When every, they get full, and this is before they actually go on diversion, if the recess section gets full, some of our patients get moved out to the acute side. And there is some sort of general guidelines as who's supposed to be taking care of this patient, but it's nowhere close to the nursing ratio that is in the recess section. And of course, the patient develops status asthmaticus, and we have to actually like, move them physically back into recess to intubate, paralyze, and get them stabilized to get uh, safely moved upstairs. So what happened here? What are the issues in this case? Well, the ICUs were full. Um, and not just the MICU in this case. The hospital should have been on diversion a lot sooner than they did. But again, there's a lot of variables that affect that decision to go on diversion. And the recess area was full. The ED was crowded because their doors were still open. People are still walking off the street. And is there a good way to provide the, for the ongoing management of ICU patients? Because this kid was definitely, this guy was definitely an ICU player. And he had high risk for decompensation. Should he have been moved to acute? Well, and in this day, actually, he was the least sick. So I'm not faulting him for this decision. But are there alternatives that we should be thinking about? So why are we crowded in the ED? Well, we're in a, you know, EMTALA. Doors are always open. We serve everybody. We're a safety net hospital. ED is crowd, crowded with non-urgent visits. There are, sorry, there are lots of ED and hospital closings around the country consolidating the basically the demand to specific institutions. The throughput is slower. We're seeing sicker and older patients. The, the threat of the nursing strike was really big like, that we were concerned about in the IC. I'm sure you guys were as well on the floors. But the staffing ratios was one of the key things that they were concerned about. You keep getting more patients in there. The ED nurses are taking care for a lot more patients and it takes just longer for them to really take care of them. And then, of course, there's bottleneck in the output. There is limited inpatient bed availability, or at least this is a fixed, uh, fixed resource. But we also know that there's a lot of downsides to ED crowding. There are delay. So this is just a, a billboard of like that they are advertising how long of the wait to see a doctor. But that being said, yeah, it's it's deceptive because this is how long to see the first contact with a provider. There's still delays in triage and diagnosis if the ED is crowded. So delays in getting the imaging for stroke, getting uh, pain medications, um, getting antibiotics for CAP. There's longer times in getting critical treatment for severe sepsis and decreased protocol adherence or uh, completion, increased mortality, increased adverse events after and STEMI as well as increased errors just associated with the high workload in the ED. All these things have been studied and documented, and we haven't really seen a systematic change at the level of the EDs across, our uni of, across the United States. But the question is, can we predict surge? And this is all, again, mapping the data that we have. We can actually look at the historical data and apply it to identify targets for improvement with a measurable change for a higher impact. All of the patients for the ED, this is not unique to Mount Sinai, it's not unique to Yale, it's not unique to anywhere, it's just that they come in the afternoon and evening. So if we can get the ward beds empty or earlier on in the day, in the morning even, that allows those beds to be clean and ready for incoming ED patients. And again, this does this has been studied in the ED itself and for a 450 bed community teaching hospital in central Pennsylvania. Seeing which saw about 62,000 ED visits a year, Falvo and colleagues found that if they improved boarding to the two hour metric that they were looking for, one one, this one small hospital could see up to 11,000 more hours of clinical time, about 3,000 more visits, and generate 4 million in additional revenue. You know, multiply this or 10 uh, by two or 10, depending on a hospital, like how much volume we see, we're about 100,000 ED visits a year. And you're actually going to see a measurable financial improvement, but also be able to serve more patients, which is what we want to do. Now, JACO, or Joint Commission, has actually recommended that boarding timeframes in the ED not exceed four hours in the interest of patient safety and quality of care. That's the recommendation. It's not a requirement because too many people complained, 
So it's just a recommendation. But ASAP, the American College of Emergency Physicians, specified they had released a policy statement that said staffing patterns applicable to other specialized areas and units of the hospital should apply equally to the ED. So if it's an ICU patient, they should be getting ICU level care at the same intensity. Yes, it's not happening. But the same thing goes for ward patients. Are these ward patients that are having like basically less than 10% of a nurse getting the same attention that they would if they were upstairs in the wards? I, I think some people would say no. And the reality is, is it's nobody's fault because originally the classic approach to the EDI interface, what these ED docs used to do was just resuscitation. But with increased demand comes longer delays in getting the ICU beds. So as such, the EM docs are actually faced with providing more and more the ongoing management that previously was in the auspices of inpatient intensivists. So I asked the EM docs that I surveyed about what are the challenges to providing ongoing care. They're comfortable taking care of critically ill patients, but they have too high a patient volume to do it well. They have insufficient support staff. They don't have the ICU patient nurse ratio I, that they, we do upstairs. They don't have enough RTs. And they have trouble providing ongoing interventions at the level that they, they is recommended for ICU level patients. So here's a third case. It's actually someone who was admitted to medicine. Um, and this is a 77-year-old guy. Uh, heart, he's got heart failure, EF of 16%, recent ICU <laughs> removal for lead infection, who's presenting to the ED with ultra mental status. He's admitted to medicine at 4 o'clock, but no beds yet. Around 6 o'clock, he's under the hospital service. He's actually transferred to uh, recess for hypotension. An hour later, sepsis alert goes off. He gets, gets two liters of fluid automatically. You know, um, He's actually upgraded to the step-down unit at this point. Um, the, the medicine team, the residents actually came down, or MAPA or TR, whatever the residence is that comes down, actually changed. It's like, you know, this patient should go to the step-down unit. So actually, in this, at this time... Again, the four medicine beds, four medicine step-down beds was a different team it was assigned to. So there was a bit of a switch there. But at 3 o'clock, the, uh, bottle, the blood cultures come back positive with gram-negative rods. So the nurses are trying to reach the medicine team, unable to, but they, they ask the ED resident. ED resident writes an order for antibiotics, so at least the antibiotics get given as quickly as possible. But the lactate is rising, and as is the trope. And the nurse tries calling the medicine residents again. It's a change of shift. Medicine comes down, but they're very concerned about the patient. RT gets called. RT automatically gives two liters of fluid, calls an ICU consult. But RT and medicine actually both go to take care of other patients, and now it's just ICU and cardiology was called the previous night at the bedside with the patient. And... Now the patient's blood pressure is 70 over 40, patient's in NSVT. We're very concerned that the patient has both septic as well as cardiogenic shock, and we were like, don't give him more fluids, nothing. Don't give any more. But the RT attending had said to give an additional two liters of fluid. ED resin is like, I don't know the case. I don't understand who I can be listening to. There are too many attendings, at the, you know, basically giving him instructions. And unfortunately, at this point, patient has received now four liters of fluid, and was developing respiratory distress. At 9.41, the patient get, gets intubated for respiratory distress and goes into VT arrest. Now, what happened here? Well, again, there were no ward beds. Maybe this wouldn't have happened. The patient had just gone up straight away to the wards and gotten settled in right away. There were greater than six teams involved when we went back through the chart. There was off-unit coverage of a boarding patient, meaning that these the primary team wasn't physically located in the ED, and that's been uh, found to be an issue with caring for these patients in an ongoing manner. And there was also differing and contradictory, contradictory management decisions. Who's really in charge at this point? So when we rethink critical care delivery, there are optimal and practical approaches, sure. This is, again, applying the operations research um, to methods to operations management. And maybe there should be changes to infrastructure and resource allocation so that we can make sure we provide system level improvements in how we're staffing these patients, how we're caring for these patients. But sometimes it does take changes in that resource allocation. Maybe we should think about the models of care delivery. Maybe we should change who's the captain of the ship, you know, who's the key decision maker. 
like what are the resources that that decision maker has at their disposal? Where where should these patients be taken care of? What's the best fit for your institution? For Sinai, maybe different at the main hospital versus at West, at, at, at St. Luke's, at Brooklyn, it really depends. But we shouldn't be afraid of a change in our structure. Um, by the way, anybody got tickets? No? <laughs> it's gonna be awesome. This weekend, this weekend. Um, so the traditional care models that we often see in the ED is that it's the ED model, which is what we have here at Sinai, that the ED is in control of these patients. And it's, they have ED-based resources, it's limited, it's located in the general ED, you know, hopefully in recess, maybe they get pushed out to acute. At other places, including St. Luke's and West, they have an ICU model where there's a handoff, a discrete handoff that happens between the ED team and the ICU team, and there's this roving ICU team that takes over the management of these patients. But they still rely on a lot of the ED staffing and support to make sure that the management is executed and the patient's well taken care of. But now we're seeing popping up all over the country alternative care models. So the ED ICU, I don't know if any of you guys uh, have trained in a shop which had one because it's been now about four years or so that we're starting to see these models come out. And this is where there's a, fit, a separate unit or a physical space within the ED that's built like an ICU. It's under the control of ED intensivists. It's an outpatient setting, but it's basically an ICU within the ED. And this is critical care based resources, critical care resources comparable to what you're gonna get in inpatient ICU. This is in terms of the protocols, in terms of the nurse ratio, in terms of the RTs, everything. It is a very expensive endeavor and I have no idea where we would find the square footage to put an ED ICU within our shop. But some places have this kind of space. Cost them $8 million to do this at Michigan. All right. But they had a family donate the money and they're also in Michigan. There's nothing in Ann Arbor, right? It's like they have lots of space. <laughs> We're also seeing other things. So let's try to work with the space that we have. So there's also the tele ICU model where they actually use uh, intensivists in an EICU setting and they actually move that robot, that screen with the interaction with the patient into the physical spaces of the ED patients. They help them sort of management of the vent, sepsis, protocol adherence, initiating early gold record therapy as appropriate to a patient's true cardiovascular, like how much volume they can really take. So this is again, getting a high quality critical care consultation in the ED in a timely fashion, regardless if you have a physical body to physically go down there. At shock trauma, they have something called a critical care receiving unit, which is a standalone unit Again, a general ED pool, a general ICU pool that will take anybody, offload the ED as needed, take outside hospital transfers, and then they'll stabilize them and dispo them to the primary ICU, like the surgical ICU if needed, the OR, the MICU, whatever they need, but it's a separate standalone unit. And then, again, it depends, I don't know where you guys trained, but hospice models have actually um, been employed where the hospice service is actually the people who take care of these borders. And they've actually found that hospitalists taking care of the throughput for these critical patients has actually improved their throughput, improved their outcomes. They're smaller studies, but it's actually interesting to me to deploy others to basically augment the, our ability to provide critical care because there's not that many critical care folks out there. And a lot of the stuff I do um, is not specific to what to my boarding. But actually, these are especially considering that you guys are all taking care of critical ill patients on the floor. Why couldn't you also, you have the same knowledge and experience to be able to take care of critical ill patients in the ED if needed? Again, this is looking at expanding our workforce with more uh, non siloed approach. How about that? So, when we think about, uh, I want to sort of end with some best practices and next steps, but let's talk about that case, what happened. Um, so the second half of the ED, we handed off to the SICU, told them, super, super sick patient. Um, and guide and surge were at the bedside. They wanted to do a semi-urgent um, uh, OR for just, they wanted to do an X-lap. Um, but the patient was still stable, so that's why they said it was semi-urgent. And there was going to be an, um, a SICU bed available. But unfortunately... The SICU bed that finally became available at 3 o'clock actually gets given to an OR case instead of the patient going to the PACU. So then we've lost the 
bed and the patient, my, my patient, 32 year old woman is staying downstairs in the ED, in a crowded ED on a Saturday afternoon and unfortunately Saturday night. So she actually gets considerably worse. She's clinically worsening. Finally at four o'clock in the morning, another sick bed opens up. She's actually taken to the OR almost immediately where she arrests and she got ROSC after 20, over 20 minutes and uh, she died in the SICU at 11 o'clock. It sucked. She was like four days postpartum. And, like it was, it was a bad case. Like there was a lot of people saying, "Oh, this should have happened. This should have happened." None of, and there were so many people involved in care, and we all were trying to do the right thing by her, but the system was broken. And so, what went wrong here? So, there, sure. POC. She had POC. Retained products of conception. She should have, like, the thing is, like, the, the plan was right. She was, at that time, when they made a decision to do semi-urgent surgery, that was the right thing to do. But her monitoring would, I think, I personally think it would have been better had she been in an ICU setting or had augmented uh, critical care services down in the ED. So there was poor communication between teams. This is what ended up happening. There was poor communication between teams. There was long delays in moving that patient to the appropriate uh, location of care. Um, there was also confusion as to who was responsible. When we talked about the case, we debriefed as as a MICU, as a SICU, as a group of all of the IC, ICCM. That was, was, this predated ICCM, but um, the reality was no no one was like, oh, it was the MICU was in charge, no, the SICU was in charge, no, the ED was in charge. It wasn't really clear as to who the captain of the ship was. And there was delays to necessary intervention in part because there was inadequate monitoring of the patient. So 11.30 when guidance and surgery were at the bedside making the decision, well, there's a long time before the patient goes to the OR at 6 o'clock the next morning. But we can figure out ways to fix this, right? So what are our solutions? This is where we're applying operations management and practice. We can do our RCA. We can figure out what the issue was. So for, you know, we have uncoordinated admissions and discharges, late discharges, inability to discharge patients. There's all reasons why we can't get these beds open. But there's also things, again, this is why I brought up in operations management that we think about culture and organizational behavior and things like that. Because one of the big issues with these delays and and getting patients to where they need to go in these sort of really vulnerable transitions of care. So we have a lack of communication, collaboration, and information. And there are systematic ways to improve that. Part of it is to have more open conversations and to decide how we're providing critical care. And we, we also have to think more innovatively about how to uh, care for these patients. You know, thinking about how to provide services outside of the ICU is becoming more and more common, as I showed you all the different models that are currently out there. An ICU without wall scenario is the ideal. Is Can we create additional beds with fixed or as-needed staffing? Like, can we use an EDIC if you have the space? Uh, a second unit, like a critical care receiving unit, like shock trauma. Can we use pack use? Can we overflow to other units that could be... Uh, increase the staffing up to become an ICU if needed. And then it's this idea of like just the manpower issue. Maybe it's not a physical space. We just need to mobilize and get the required expertise to the bedside faster or just more eyes on these patients. Then there's also this idea of flexible units and RNRT staffing. In the OR world, um, Flexibility is one of these things that they model, and they find without fail, it is the most effective way and most cost-effective way to use resources to better a system or address a problem like, like delayed um, transfers in care. And unfortunately, this is not what people like to do. They like to know how many patients they're taking care of. They want fixed ratios and things like that. They don't want to be told that you're going to take care of two patients now, but you could go up to four if your patients are lower acuity. That kind of uncertainty is very hard to sell to both RTs and RNs and even to MDs. Like, and especially with ACGME requirements of how many patients a resident can take care of, that's also really tough. But I don't know if there's a way to do this, but the idea of being pluripotent, being able to take care of different types of patients it's actually something that can really improve the quality of care that's being delivered to these patients. We also can think about offloading the slower acuity patients to improve the ICU bed availability. And uh, this is where, remember we talked about the, the step down unit, whether it was appropriate to be used as a stopgap measure for that other patient. Well, we did a simulation looking at 
the 50 ICU and step down beds at Yale and what would happen if we reallocated some of those step down beds to the ICU. And we found that increasing the ICU size, of course, led to improved wait times of the higher acuity patients, the ICU level patients, but longer wait times for the lower acuity patients, longer wait times for the patients who just need the step down. And that may be okay because it's the ICU patients that are potentially more sensitive to the weight or more at risk for bad outcomes with these prolonged waits. But Dr. Gershengorn and colleagues looked at the effect of bed expansion with the addition of a four bed step down unit to their hospital compared to one that did not have a step down unit. And there was no change in hospital mortality, but the interventional hospital saw a significant improvement in the wait times for ICU admission because at least those four step down beds allowed for offloading the ICU, so a real step down process in a more rapid fashion. We can also expedite hospital wide flow. 5 p.m., 5th Avenue, there's a line of ambulances. Why are they leaving at rush hour? I have no idea. But can we target an 11 a.m. discharge? We did this at Yale with the Safe Patient Flow Initiative to get people out. The residents, this started when I was a resident. I got paid $2 every time I got a patient out. No, two, listen, that's a cup of coffee in New Haven. Two, and like, we, I got those coupons. I was able to get a coffee and a croissant. It was amazing. Um, but these little incentives to try to get our patients out or do the paperwork early before rounds to get them out by 11 o'clock allowed these beds to become available. We can address pinch points with improved turnover times for transfer and housekeeping. You know, how fast, how, are these delays, like, because we don't have enough staff that can be deployed to turn over these beds in a regular fashion? I know we can do this in an emergency because I have seen people move with a sense of purpose when there are no ICU beds and we have people waiting because all of a sudden there are people waiting with the curtains ready to hang and ready to go as soon as the, the bed is emptied. All these things can happen, but it's not happening in a systematic way because you can't always anticipate when that next bed will be vitally needed. We also need to balance elective versus non-elective admissions. That patient uh, could have stayed in the PACU instead of using up my SICU bed for my patient. All right, it did not need to happen. And this was a very flashy headline in New York Times a few years ago looking at STEMIs, and they said faster care helps death rate plunge 38% in a decade. Very fancy. And what they did to improve the door to needle time was that they did a detailed analysis of the holdups in treating patients. They did process mapping. They looked at operations of how we delivered care to these patients. And this was promoted by the ACC and the AHA. Why can't we do this for ICU patients, for sepsis patients, for patients who are vented, to get them where they need? Because we're not able to measure how bad it really is, but we're seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's not just admin's problem, this idea of like Helen Brandon's emails about, you know, we're red surge status all the time. It's actually a high visibility issue with clear impact on patients. It's in the lay press. It's on social media. I mean, there's a lot, at least on my feed, there's a lot of Mount Sinai bashing because of how long the, we have to wait in our ED. This is a national epidemic that's been recognized by the Institute for, of Medicine, that we are not able to serve the, the actual increasing demand of patients because we have all these inefficiencies. And unfortunately, a lot of these decisions are being made by people who don't really know what's going on in, a clinical, in the clinical setting. And uh, our voices, our, our perspectives are not being communicated, part of because we're not necessarily included or there are competing priorities. So I would actually say that uh, it, it's great to have more involvement of clinical folks in the sort of admin world to really address these issues, to find solutions that meet both priorities, both the maintaining high quality, safe care, and also improving things like financial performance and decreasing ambulance diversion and the like. So what are the next steps? Well, I think, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that <laughs> process mapping to understand flow and operations is something that can be vital in how we can care and improve the care for boarding critically ill patients. And then we, there has to be a lot more collaboration between the ED and the wards to delineate shared metrics for smooth operations. We need to de-silo and improve flow. This is a, not just an ED issue, this is not just an ICU issue, especially all the different kinds of ICUs, but actually a hospital-wide issue. We need to increase our flexibility and have shared expectations of what needs to happen. And then perform a joint evaluation of patient outcomes. I'm actually giving a talk at an EM conference about transdisciplinary research. Um, and this idea that like 
ED, when they do a lot of the research, they just look at ED-based metrics and then like hospital outcome. They don't look at what happens in the hospitalization. And the same thing happens for ICU studies where they sort of discount what's happening in the ED and they just sort of start the clock when they actually get admitted. But all of these different points in the care spectrum really affect the care that our patients get as well as their overall outcomes. And with that, I will say thank you. I went very quickly. And this is the people who uh, mentor me and support me and are on my team. And uh, any questions? Yes. Yes, yes. How about boarding of dentist patients? Nope. Nope, absolutely not. Oh, yeah, there's still dental patients downstairs. Uh, until the bed becomes available. There is a rule at Sinai that says that two, I think they're trying to limit the number of vented patients two per floor per, because of the burden to nurses. But I have definitely, uh, I don't know if, how many of you guys remember the Mars service. This is before RT happened. So RT is great. I think RT has been amazing to change how we care for patients. But they're so busy that they are actually caring for the initial triage for what, who cares for these patients after they say, yeah, the patient needs the ICU. Then they have to go take care of another RT call. It's you guys, right? Yeah. yeah. So before Mars, we actually had the understanding that I was told that we, we also were part of the ongoing management until they physically got to a unit. And that resource is not the equivalent. So the burden is back on you. And I definitely have been a, like walking by a unit where the uh, floor, where the alarms on the vent are going off and people don't know what's happening. You know, not, and, and this is not the doctors, but actually the nurses who are managing the patient, but they don't know why the vent is alarming. So who's going to help out that patient right then? You know, because it's not, we don't have the same, we don't have a dedicated RT to every floor, you know, to, I don't know. And, and these problems are things that can be solved. They just have to be solved in a systematic way. So with all your research, have you um, communicated this research to the higher power? Yeah, so when I apply, when I started this, so um, this was when ICCM was just developing, when Stefan Mara was the first ICCM director, and then it was Andy, and then Rupa. And they actually were letters of support on my grant to sort of map out what was happening here in Sinai. And one of the main things was that we had to have centralized bed management. But unfortunately, it's not an automated process. And some of the, the hurdles we hit was that we hadn't upgraded our EPIC system to bed time, which just happened last year, I think. And so the infrastructure to do a more systematic approach to flow haven't been put into place. So we can decide, we can change the attitudes, the organizational behavior, the structure behind critical care delivery. And a lot of those steps have happened. You know, it, hopefully you guys are seeing that it's faster to get a patient off the floor to an ICU, you know, than it used to be. We're seeing a lot more, at least the MICU is seeing a lot more MICU warders and other units, um, as opposed to the SICU saying, no, we're reserving those beds, or the neurosurgical, the CTIC saying, no, we're not taking those patients. Um, so that's improved, but and the looking at the numbers, the time that patients are spending, at least on the not so much the ED but the wards, the time of accept to time of admission has actually decreased as a result because there are more ICU beds at the disposal for uh, transfer from the wards to the ICU. The ED has not seen that kind of change because the volume of ED admissions for ICU has actually increased. This may change. They're trying to make Nine West a little bit more stepped out. Every bed is supposed to be trying to make it stepped out ready. We're not sure exactly who's going to staff what yet, but at least there'll be more resources available. Yeah. Can you tell us more of um, some of the other outcomes, or if you know of the other outcomes for like the telehealth? So. I, have, I actually don't do um, EIC, EIC research, LIC research personally. I have collaborators who do. And this has been primarily studied or written about by the UMass group and looking at uh, just ICU, EICU support for other smaller ICUs. It is a new thing to actually deploy in EDs or in wards or lower acuity units or anything like that. And I actually don't think it's actually used in the wards very much at all, um, mostly because, again, most, most hospitals have some kind of ICU. So if a patient is sick enough, 
they will be upgraded to that, and then they will call the ICU, the EICU consult. Um, and for those hospitals that do it, they say it's cost, the, the research suggests that it's cost effective and that it's safe because there is immediate recognition if a patient needs to be upgraded to a tertiary care center, and they're able to make sure that the, the low-hanging fruit are addressed, things like making sure they're on the right vent settings, they're getting the right fluids and the right pressors and in a timely fashion, that kind of thing. Uh, it's a totally new area to think about um, a telemedicine in a, for the ED or uh, for decompensating patients. It hasn't been done yet that I know of. Yes? Yeah, so the, the, the clinical research has been primarily on nurses. And uh, I don't know of anything specifically on RT staffing in terms of that ratio. Um, and the operations research uh, literature that has modeled this, the simulation, have all been on nurses. Because un unfortunately for physicians, there's only so many of us. Um, and they, we continue to take patients regardless. It's not like we, have, especially attendees, still have a cap. Um, there is some um, very nice data looking at APPs and how that they can sort of offload and improve the, um, the safety ratios and decrease the number of near misses and things like that. And of course, staff satisfaction is higher. So I'm, I'm a pro APP person, um, as, even in critical care, even though I know that that's not necessarily the, the, what everybody does here, you know, but it's a model that I'm used to and honestly it doesn't matter to me. I just need somebody to take care of the patient. I don't care. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.